Welcome everybody to this virtual foraging walk, which we're doing in Eastern Massachusetts. So as uh, you probably know, the original concept was to do this on the campus of Wheaton College during the actual in-person International Herb Symposium. So since that isn't happening this year, we've moved it to a virtual foraging walk, but we've stayed in Eastern Mass to be in the same kind of region where some of the same kind of plants that grow on Wheaton College campus are here and we picked an organic farm to do it because organic farms are great foraging places. So why is that? The obvious reason number one is they're not slathering everything with chemicals. Reason number two is that the wonderful stuff that's in the living organic soil that makes the organically grown fruits and vegetables so nutritious to eat, all that good stuff is getting to the weeds too. So the weeds you harvest at organic farms are gonna be larger and luscious and more nutritious than let's say weed growing in a crack in the sun. Then the third reason is the way that organic farms manage weeds is they do it strategically. They're not weeding every square inch of the farm every single day. They weed where they need to. So if you time your visit right uh, to an organic farm, you can find huge amounts of weeds, enough to feed large groups of people. And let's hope we can gather with large groups of people in the near future. And then the fourth reason, like where I'm standing right now, where we've encountered this crab apple tree, is the edges of organic farms happen to have good edge habitats where there's fruit trees, nut trees, berry bushes, stuff like that. So my advice is form a symbiotic relationship with your local organic farmer because they have the weeds you want the weeds, so potentially it's this great partnership. So don't go and just start foraging at organic farm. You need to talk to the staff first, make sure they're okay with it. Uh, and actually that's general advice I'd give about any foraging. If it's possible to talk to the landowner, land manager, and check in with them, make sure it's okay. Uh, if you're able to get permission from somebody, then you can forage in a really joyful way and you don't have to be peeking around your shoulder every once in a while, uh, worrying is somebody going to, you know, give you grief for what you're doing. So, yes, so I encourage getting permission when you can. All right, so uh, let's talk about crab apples while we're here. So crab apples vary in size from really teeny fruits that I wouldn't bother with to fruits that are over an inch in diameter. And... Um, and the main thing you do with what I do with crab apples is you make a crab apple jelly. And so you look for, so this is a great time to spot the plants when they're blooming, remember where they are. And then you want to go at the end of the summer, early fall to look for the ripe fruit. And the ripe fruit, as I say, varies in size, it varies in color. And what you want to do is you want to bite into one of those ripe fruits. And you want it to have a nice fruity, nice apple flavor. If it's got an astringent aftertaste or a bitter aftertaste where your cheeks kind of cave in, that's fine. Don't worry about that. But the beginning taste should be nice and fruity and appley because if there's no flavor or it's not a good flavor, your jelly isn't going to come out that good. So make sure you start with a good crab apple. And I, and I just like to pick the larger crab apples, like three quarters of an inch or, or so, or even bigger, just because there's less labor involved in gathering them. And so you bring them home and I slice every crab apple crosswise or lengthwise, doesn't really matter, and throw it in a big pot, uh, like a lobster pot, and put enough water in it so it's more or less equal with the level of the fruit in the pot. And simmer it for a while. I can't give you an exact uh, amount of time, but you know it's about the right amount of time when the flesh of the crab apples in the pot begin to lose their color and they have kind of a, a dull color. That means they've given up their flavor into the liquid and then take the entire contents of the pot and put it in a big jelly bag and allow the juice to drip out. And if you want a nice, clear, sparkling jelly, don't squeeze the bag. Just let the juice that comes out of the bag come out. And I want more juice, so I squeeze the bag and I get at least twice as much juice that way. And then you put the juice in a saucepan and you start heating up. Oh, before you do that, you measure an, equi an, equi an equal volume of sugar to the juice that you process. So you have three cups of sugar, three cups of juice, Put the uh, crab apple juice that you've processed back in the saucepan on the stove, heat it up, add the sugar, and then you will begin to see the jelly form on the sides of the saucepan just as it's splashing up there as you're stirring it. Now, how is that? I haven't mentioned pectin at all. It's because crab apples are loaded with pectin. In fact, they have so much pectin in them that you can add some of another fruit, let's say elderberries, for example, or cherries or other fruits that don't have pectin in them, and there's enough pectin in the crab apples to still make it gel properly. And then, um, you know, so there's ways of like also 
you know, putting in a jelly thermometer or you stick a spoon in the jelly and you watch how the, uh, the juice sheets off the spoon instead of drips off. Those are other ways to tell when the jelly is fine. And then when it's done, you just pour it into your sterilized jars and, uh, and crab apple jelly is a great illustration of the fact that wild fruit makes a better jelly than cultivated fruit because the robustness of the flavor in the raw fruit that isn't so nice to eat as a raw piece of fruit stands up to the jelly making process and makes more, much more interest, interesting final product. And the, the example I give of that is to compare crab apple jelly with apple jelly because crab apple jelly has got a lot more character to it than apple jelly. Now I'd like to talk to you about the, t the genus Tilia, which is uh, linden or basswood or several other names, but uh, they're all edible. You can lump them all together. So here in Eastern Mass, uh, there are two species I've run into most frequently. There's the Tilia americana, which is the native species, the American basswood, and then the Tilia cordata, which is the little leaf linden from Europe that's deployed a lot as a street tree. But as I say, the plants are, are equally edible and medicinal, so let's get into those details. First of all, how did I know this was a basswood? So if you look at the leaves, they are asymmetrical. They're kind of lopsided, so I look for that as an identification key. And uh, so let's get to the edible part. So the first edible part are the young leaves, like right now, and I'll eat one in just a second. And so let me just explain though that uh, you can eat these raw and, um, and in England, they call these lime trees and they'll make lime sandwiches, which are like the watercress sandwiches on the white bread with a crust cut off. And they'll just layer these young linen leaves as the filling for the sandwich. So just like that, straight into your mouth. It's uh, tender and mild, not much flavor, but you know, would be fine in a sandwich or in a salad, something like that. The part I like even more on the linden or basswood trees isn't out yet, it's the flowers, and they come out in Eastern Mass around the first day of summer, so second, third week of June. The flower is going to be on a long stem, and it will have a bract attached to it, which is a thing that looks like a helicopter propeller, so that when the nutlets form in the plant and they break off in the parent plant, they do this on their way down, and the tree is hoping that a big gust of wind will blow the seed further away. That's the uh, evolutionary purpose of that bract. So when the flowers form in this plant, it's around the first day of summer, and they have a delightful fragrance like lemon and honey together, and you make a tea from the flowers, fresh or dried. So the flowers have, uh, it's like 10 to 12 greenish yellow flowers in a cluster. Each flower is about a quarter inch in diameter, and the whole cluster is about that big. And uh, at the end of this stem with the bract attached, and then you don't have to take the bracts off to make the tea. You just take the entire thing, brack, flowers and all, throw it in your teacup, pour the boiling water from the kettle, let it steep for a few minutes. And then as I say, it's, it's uh, really nice flavored and you can use the flowers fresh or dried. And besides tasting good, the tea has at least two medicinal values. It's soothing to your digestive system and your mental state at the same time. So as many of you herbalists in the audience know, uh, this is a really nice uh, plant to offer to people. The next plant I'd like to teach you is what I call one of the scratch and sniff species, uh, and that helps to identify it. Another thing I look for, by the way, are these leaves, which um, it's just a coincidence, but to me they look an, an awful lot like the leaves on the outside of a Briar's ice cream box. Anyway, so the scratch and sniff test on this species, like that, will reveal a very familiar smell. It's oil of wintergreen. What used to be used in like tea berry gum and wintergreen lifesavers and stuff like that. And uh, in the tree that we uh, have done the scratch and sniff test on is a black birch. By the way, the exact same thing applies to yellow birch. So black and yellow birch are synonymous in a culinary way. Everything I'm saying about black birch today is equally applied to the yellow birch, exactly the same. All right, so there's the oil of wintergreen uh, in the twigs. And when oil of wintergreen was derived from natural sources, it was distilled from the twigs of black birch trees. So they were cutting down a lot of black birch trees in order to uh, extract the oil of wintergreen from the twigs. Now oil of wintergreen is made artificially, so there are a lot more black birch trees around. So I guess that's good for us that like to gather plants from the wild. So, uh, so this is a fun plant encounter whenever you're outdoors. Um, you can just nibble on a twig to get that nice wintergreen flavor. Uh, if you're camping and you've forgotten your toothbrush, you could use a, a birch twig as a natural breath freshener. Uh, another use for the um, 
the, uh, and this is a medicinal property, so the, uh, medic the uh, chemical name for oil of wintergreen is methyl salicylate, and it is related to salicylic acid, which is the active ingredient in aspirin. And so it does have an analgesic, a pain-killing effect. So if you're hiking in the woods and you twisted your ankle, you could find a birch twig to chew on. At the very least, it would distract you from the pain in your ankle. All right, so you're probably wondering, what can you make with the uh, oil of wintergreen flavor that's in the birch twigs? Well, one really fun and easy thing to do is to make a tea from it. And uh, I'll tell you how you can do this any day of the year that you find a black and yellow birch uh, tree, by the way. So all you need to do is take uh, some twigs and take the leaves off if the leaves happen to be on during the growing season. And then you just want to break the twigs into sizes that will fit in a jar. And then just peel the twigs like that and put the peelings and the peeled twigs in the jar with water in it and let the jar sit around for an hour and you get a strong wintergreen flavored drink. It's like drinking wintergreen flavored Lifesaver. And the water doesn't have to be uh, any temperature. I recommend room temperature uh, works fine. In fact, if you try to make tea the traditional way with boiling water from the kettle and to pour it on the twigs, uh, it doesn't work that well because oil of wintergreen is very volatile, which means if you try to make a tea that way, your kitchen will smell great, but there'll be really not much flavor left in your teacup. So I recommend just uh, stuffing a, uh, a mason jar full of the peeled birch twigs and the peelings, let it sit around for an hour, and that's how you get your drink. And if you want to save it for later, you can just freeze it and then just thaw it out, and it'll keep fine in the freezer. Another thing I'd like to mention, not just on the subject of black birch trees, but actually any species of birch, is you can tap any species of birch for sap. And uh, now a tree like this, I would say, is just a little bit too small. I'd like to see a tree be at least eight inches in diameter or bigger to tap it. And you tap them exactly like you tap a maple tree with a bracing bit and the spiles. Uh, the birch sap starts flowing about two weeks after the maple stop. So here in, in Eastern Mass, that would be like uh, the beginning of April. And uh, I tapped some black birch trees on my family's land a few decades ago, and I was getting a gallon of sap in an hour. So they really, gush. unfortunately, the sap is even wider than maple sap, so you have to boil the heck out of it to get anything. And what you eventually get doesn't have the oil of wintergreen flavor at all. It looks and tastes just like molasses, which is so cheap and so easy to get. My advice would be just go buy molasses at the store. You're not going to save any time and money making your own molasses from birch sap. Having said that, if let's say you were camping during the time of the year when the birch sap was flowing and you were concerned about the potability of the water supply at the place you were camping, is you could tap the birch trees and get all the pure, clean drinking water you needed that way. The plant I'm holding now is a sumac plant. It obviously isn't poison sumac. I wouldn't be grabbing it like this. How did I know it wasn't poison sumac? Well, there's a few ways to tell. One way is if you look at the leaves of this plant, like these leaves right here, or this other sprout that came up nearby, the, the twigs are furry like young deer antler velvet, which is um, a diagnostic characteristic of staghorn sumac, which is uh, uh, Rus typhina is the botanical name. And uh, the other thing to look for is if you look up into the top branches of the tree here, you can see some old ratty berry clusters that are left over from last year's berries. So anyway, this is sumac, and um, the uh, main edible part on a sumac are the berries. It's actually an acid on the outside of the berries that you um, extract from the berries. And so uh, any sumac with the tight, upright clusters of red berries is not only not poison sumac, it's an edible sumac. Poison sumac have very loose, drooping clusters of white berries. So, uh, and it's pretty unlikely you're going to run into sumac unless you're in a very wet area. In fact, when I usually see poison sumac and you follow the trunk of the tree down to the ground, you often can't see where it goes in the ground because it's actually below the surface of the water in the swamp. All right, so uh, very unlikely you're going to run into poison sumac outside of a place like that. So anyway, um, uh, the, the drink that you make from the, uh, the red-buried sumac, so this one, uh, the staghorn sumac, or in Eastern Mass, we have the smooth sumac or the wing sumac. Uh, both of those are uh, very nice and, uh, uh, and work the same way as the staghorn sumac. And yes, I've had uh, people make the sumac powder that you see at Middle Eastern restaurants from our native sumacs. Uh, I've had it once from the staghorn sumac, and I thought that it was kind of furry, like the fruit is sort of furry. 
So I didn't really like it, but there's probably a way of making the powder from like the smooth sumac or the wing sumac where you don't have the furriness. What I will do if I want to use the sumac in cooking and not just to drink a drink like lemonade, is I'll make a really concentrated version of the sumac egg with extra berries and less water. So it's really, really tart, really, really red, really, really uh, sour. And that's what I'll use in cooking, that liquid instead of the powder to get the color and the sour flavor in there. So we've talked about black birch and tapping trees for sap. If you run out of the spiles that you buy at the hardware store, you can use hollowed out sumac stems for that purpose. So this thing here isn't really a nice specimen, but sumacs often grow in nice straight uh, sections. And you want to find one that's about a half an inch or five eighths of an inch in diameter and just cut it into three inch lengths. Poke out the pith in the center, which is soft with a coat hanger. And then you end up with this hollow tube, but you can tap into the hole you've drilled it in the tree and the sap will flow right out through that hole. It can even cut a notch into it to hang your bucket. Now I'd like to talk to you about dandelions, which uh, uh, I think is one of the species that's responsible for turning more people off of eating wild plants than anything else. And the story often goes something like this. It's the spring and somebody goes out to their backyard and they see it covered with the dandelion flowers and they say to themselves, oh, I heard dandelions are edible, I should try them. So they pick a few leaves, they bring them indoors, they put a little oil and vinegar on them, they take one bite, it's incredibly bitter, they spit it out and they say, yuck, I'm never going to eat a wild plant again, which is a real shame because dandelions are great if you eat the right part at the right time. So when I start seeing whole fields turning yellow with dandelion flowers, I think it's too late to be eating dandelions, other than the flowers, of course. But I like to harvest dandelions before the flowers bloom, and it's actually the unopened flower buds in the center of the plant, like these right here, which I consider to be the best part of the plant. In fact, I consider dandelion flower buds to be among my favorite vegetables, period, cultivated or wild. The flavor's like a cross between corn, spinach, Brussels sprouts, and artichokes. So all I do is gather up a bunch of these buds, bring them home, throw them in a, a bowl of water just to wash them off, get a pot of water boiling in the stove, throw the dandelion buds in there, and cook them for 60 seconds. That's it, that's all they need. And then you can add them to soups and omelets and casseroles. But before you do anything with them, before you even put any salt or butter on them, just try them plain. I think you'd be amazed at how good they are. And if you want to eat dandelion leaves, I gather them, uh, the, actually when the buds, before the flowers bloom is the right time to gather dandelion leaves. And while I'm picking the buds off the plants, if I see some nice tender leaves in the center of the plant, I'll gather them too and prepare them the same way. And of course, there's other parts of the plant that are edible on dandelions, like the dandelion root, which you can just boil up and eat, especially uh, at the end of the growing season. Most roots tend to, you know, have more food value and, and, uh, and perhaps more sweetness uh, once they've wintered over uh, before they start growing the following year. So uh, uh, dandelion roots are, they kind of have an artichokey flavor, and that's not surprising because dandelions and artichokes are, are somewhat related. Uh, and also you can roast dandelion roots and make a coffee, but I'm going to talk to you about another close dandelion relative that's even more well known for that. But before I do that, I'm just going to um, pick some dandelion leaves and then carry them over to the next plant I'm going to teach you, which is a close relative of dandelion. Here in my right hand are some dandelion leaves. Here in my left hand are leaves of the next plant I'm going to teach you. They're actually closely related species, edible the exact same way. So these are chicory leaves. So chicory is the next plant I'm going to teach you. So chicory leaves are edible in the spring or in the fall. In the summer they get way, way too bitter, but in the spring uh, they're usually mild enough to eat. If you find them to be too bitter, there's two things you can do to make them milder. One way is to take the entire chicory plant and dig it up and put it in your basement in a pot with some dirt in it and have the leaves grow in the dark and the leaves will turn a yellowish white and be milder that way. Another thing is if you have this growing in your own yard, you can just take like a, a clay flower pot, tip it upside down, cover the hole in the bottom of the pot and have the leaves grow in the dark in your own yard and they'll also turn yellowish white and be milder that way. So the key way to tell this plant apart from dandelion is this. This is the chicory flower stalk from last year. So this is where those blue flowers were forming. So that is chicory. And those blue flowers are edible, by the way. They don't have a lot of flavor, but blue is an unusual food color. So it's fun to sniff the petals and uh, to uh, uh, add that color into a salad. So what we're going to do now is try to show you the main part of chicory that's edible, and that is the root. So what I'm going to do is loosen the dirt around this root and then see if I can pull it up for you to show it to you. So this is uh, what the well-known coffee substitute and additive is made from. So I can already tell this is going to be a big root. 
So I'm gonna grab it, see how much I can get out. Ah, I got just a little stub of it, but it will give you the idea. So anyway, so there's a whole bunch of roots. So if I'd been more patient, had a bigger shovel, I could have dug a lot more. But that just guys to show you, you know, that's a that's an old chicory that's divided like that so many times. So uh, we will show you slides in the show of how to make uh, a beverage from this, and it's uh, it's uh, a fun project. So uh, uh, and when you brew the beverage from the chicory grounds that you make, the uh, flavor is very similar to coffee, especially if you usually drink your coffee with cream and sugar and you drink the chicory drink the same way. Flavor is very similar. The one big difference is chicory does not have caffeine in it. So if you're one of these people who says, well, what's the point of drinking it? If there's no caffeine in it, then chicory is just not going to cut it for you. So the next plant I'd like to talk to you about is pretty common weed in organic farms and gardens. It's this plant right here. And this is uh, typically what it does is sprawl all over the ground. And this plant is called the common mallow. Malva neglecta is the botanical name. And uh, in a lot of wild edibles have a very limited season of availability. Like if you want to harvest the burdock flower stalks in eastern Massachusetts, it's the first couple weeks in June, and that's pretty much it. You miss that time. You have to wait for an entire year for that time to come around in the calendar. Well, for this mallow plant, it is at this stage pretty much the entire growing season. In fact, a little bit later on when it starts to bloom and produces seed pods, I think is even better than at this stage. But at this stage, you could uh, uh, eat the plant now. Uh, you can eat the leaves raw. I find them to be a little bit coarse. So you might steam them first just to um, uh, make them a little bit more palatable. Uh, but the plant isn't bitter. It's, uh, it also has a mucilaginous quality, which it shares with most other species in the Malvaceae, which is the botanical family that mallows belong to. So, like for example, this plant is related to the plant called marshmallow. Yes, marshmallows have that name because it, they used to be made from a plant called the marshmallow, which is actually a European species, which uh, is grown in gardens around here. It doesn't really escape uh, into the wild, at least not in Eastern Mass. Uh, but this one does, and I actually have a recipe that I got from uh, John Callis, a guy who teaches wild edibles out in the West Coast in Oregon, for making marshmallows from this species, and I just haven't <laughs> done it yet. So, but, uh, but, there, but there is such a thing, and I, I believe uh, that he makes it from the roots of this plant. Uh, uh, but uh, I apologize for not remembering that detail. But anyway... So this uh, species, as I said, gets a little bit more interesting later on in the growing season when it begins to bloom and produce its seed pods. So I'll just describe this to you, to you now because we don't have any to point to. So what you're going to see are these little purple flowers with a big pistil in the center, which is characteristic of the flower structure plants in the hibiscus genus, which is in the Malvaceae. So it's a relative of this common mallow. And... Um, and so it's, it's diminutive, it's small, but it has that familiar looking hibiscus flower structure. And then that's followed by a little seed pod that looks exactly like a green wheel of cheese. And so back during the days when kids would play with plants before they had all these modern high tech distractions like cell phones and video games and stuff like that, kids used to go outside and play with plants. And, and I hope some of you in the audience are, were kids like that. I was a kid like that. And so you look at the mallow plant and you'll see the little uh, pink flowers on there. And amongst them, you'll see the little things that um, they'll have a little five part green wrapping that covers up the seed pod like that. And you lift that up and you see a round light green thing that looks exactly like a little wheel of cheese, about a quarter of an inch in diameter. And those you can eat raw. So the, the name that kids would call them are cheeses. And yes, you could pop those right in your mouth. They don't have much flavor, but they have that uh, mucilaginous quality. Or you can cook with them. You could actually use those uh, little um, common mallow seed pods as an okra substitute. It has the same effect as okra in cooking as it adds uh, body to uh, the stew, whatever you're making with it.
So I'd like to talk to you about sassafras now, and one of the edible parts on sassafras is the root. And to get at the root, you have to dig it up or yank it up, but I don't do that without checking to make sure I'm seeing some other sassafras plants around, which is pretty typical. Sassafras is a clonal species, so where you see a little shoot like this look around, you almost always see other sprouts coming up. So there's this one, and this one, and then this one, and this one, and then there's other ones in here too. And they're, they're uh, very likely to be all coming off a common root system. So when you pull up a sassafras and you get a section root, you're not killing an individual plant. You're just sort of pruning a stem that's coming off a root system. So I do check to make sure that there's other stems coming up, though, before I yank out any, just because I wouldn't want to uh, extirpate the plant. I just want to harvest it respectfully. So check to make sure you're seeing other stems at least six more in the area before you think of yanking up any. All right, so now we'll come over here. And so just go to the bottom and give it a little tug like this to get a section of root out. So, so that's what we have. So there's actually two different smells on here and we'll go around the corner and then I'll talk to you about it some more, about this sassafras plant. Nancy has agreed to help me teach the next plant. This is sassafras and behind me, is a blooming sassafras plant. So sassafras plants come in male and female. And I honestly can't tell you without a hand lens whether the flowers behind me are male or female. But uh, that would tell, you know, I'd see, you know, stamens giving off pollen if it were a male flower and so on. And, uh, and I have gathered sassafras berries to propagate sassafras plants with. So I don't consider the berries to be edible. But there are two edible parts on sassafras. There's the root and then the young leaves. So uh, I'm going to scrape off. There's another one of the scratch and sniff plants. So I'm going to scrape off part of the bark and Nancy's going to tell me what it smells like. Sassafras? <laughs> <laughs> yes, no. but, okay. but what have you had in your life that has that, that flavor? Has that flavor. What have you drunk? Root beer. Right, right. Okay. So this was a major flavor ingredient in root beer for a long time. Now sassafras, it's a Native American plant, actually Native American indigenous people of, of what the area that's now the United States use this plant extensively on the eastern seaboard. And it was one of the species that um, the first European explorers, like the Sir Walter Raleigh types, got very excited about when they first encountered it in the late 1500s and they brought it back to Europe and they presented it with a lot of fanfare to the royal courts as a way of justifying the enormous sums the monarchs were shelling out to support these expeditions. Look, we found sassafras. And uh, Native Americans used sassafras medicinally and they taught it to the Europeans. The Europeans took it back. And there was uh, quite a, a sassafras craze going on in Europe in the late 1500s, uh, in early 1600s, in fact they would sail sailing ships pretty much empty for the primary purpose of filling them up with sassafras plants and sailing them back to Europe. That's how uh, much this plant was in demand for a while. One of those ships, by the way, is captained by a guy named Bartholomew Gosnell, who uh, in 1602 was traveling around Buzzards Bay and south of Cape Cod, and he's the one who named Martha's Vineyard after his daughter. And he was here on a sassafras gathering expedition. And the, uh, the uh, Wampanoags, the, uh, the uh, Aquina Wampanoags, uh, were enlisted to help gather the plants uh, that filled that boat. So anyway, all right, so all these tea houses sprung up in Europe and people are drinking sassafras tea. It has the nice flavor and it has all this reputed medicinal uses. So people felt it was good for their health and stuff. And then the, develop, the reputation developed that sassafras tea was good for syphilis. And people stopped drinking the tea in public. Why is that? Because they didn't want anybody else to think that they had syphilis. And so that sort of brought an end to the sassafras craze. All right. So yes, so the sassafras root, you can wash off and you can take the entire root and put it in water and just uh, simmer it for a while to get that strong root beer uh, aroma flavor out and uh, make a drink that way. And you could reuse the root several times before losing its potency. And as far as I know, any time of year is fine. So in fact, you can recognize sassafras in the middle of winter because of these green twigs. So even if the leaves weren't out, that's how you can spot it. You just do the scratch and sniff test, which Nancy will do for a second for the upper part of the plant to, to 
know what it is and then carry on from there. All right, so, and in my foraging book, I've got a res recipe for sassafras candy, which is like the root beer barrels you used to buy at the penny candy store, only even stronger because it's little bits of root bark that you can't eat. All right. Now, having said all that, I should tell you in the interest of food, full disclosure that the Food and Drug Administration uh, currently, as far as I know, believes that one of the constituents of the sassafras root bark an essential oil called saffron is carcinogenic. And that determination is based on several studies where they fed rats a huge amount of synthesized saffron, and some of those rats got cancer. And that was enough to convince the FDA that they should ban saffron containing sassafras products from the food supply. And that ban, as far as I know, is still in effect. But I have never heard any um, even anecdotal stories about humans getting cancer from consuming sassafras products, so uh, sassafras root products. So, and there's also saffron and cinnamon and nutmeg, and they haven't banned cinnamon or nutmeg. So a cynical person might say, well, the sassafras lobby wasn't strong enough to fight off the government regulators. So I will let you decide, you know, and, and if you come to the conclusion that, well, Food and Drug Administration is saying it might be carcinogenic, the saffron and the sassafras root bark. So I don't think I'll use it. And, you know, I actually support you wherever your comfort level is about anything I'm talking about in this virtual wild edibles walk. So if you're not confident you've identified the plant correctly, you're not confident that the place where you might want to collect the plant is an uncontaminated area and you decide not to eat it, I think that's pretty sensible. All right, so uh, let's go to the upper part of the plant. And I'm going to scratch this and Nancy can sniff that and tell us what it smells like. Oh. I can't think of what it is. All right, so I, yeah. I, I will put a suggestion in your mind. Okay. So I had a woman a few years back who said that to me, this smelled just like Fruit Loop cereal. Oh. <laughs> now, I will admit, you know, it was a long while ago, but I can admit that I remember what Fruit Loops taste like. And I think the aroma coming off this sassafras twig is very similar to Fruit Loops cereal. Obviously, they're not putting sassafras in Fruit Loops. It's just a bizarre coincidence. But anyway... That same flavor that you're smelling down there is also in the young sassafras leaves. So leaves like this, sir, I'd let them get a little bigger than this, you know, because these are kind of teeny, but let them get an inch, an inch and a half long. This is what is used to make filet powders. If you've ever heard of filet powder, filet powder is dried, powdered, young sassafras leaves. So you can make your own. As far as I know, there's no saffo on the leaves, so the whole carcinogen issue is not relevant here. So you gather up a bunch of these leaves and... And, you know, for a plant I've already uprooted out of the ground, you could pick all the leaves. But if you're picking leaves off live sassafras plants, don't strip all the leaves off one plant. Pick a few off this plant, a few off that plant, so the plant can handle that amount of harvesting. Then take those leaves and just spread them out in a cookie sheet and just stick it out in an airy place. You don't have to use a food dehydrator or anything. And just leave them alone for several weeks and the leaves will get dry and crumbly. So just crumble them up, sift out any fibers, like any central stems that are in there, and you have this powder, which you can put into a little salt or pepper type shaker, and then you could add that to your food to flavor it and thicken it just before you serve it. So one thing I forgot to talk about um, um, with this plant is the exceedingly easy way to recognize it once the leaves get bigger. And that is the leaves have three different shapes, no thumbs one thumb and two thumbs, leaves with this shape all on the same plant. It's the only plant that does that. So very easy to know. On the edge of this organic farm where we're filming this virtual wild edibles walk, we have both black cherry and choke cherry. And this is choke cherry. And one of the ways to tell is the leaves are stubbier and more oval shaped than the black cherries, which are more lancelet or pointy. And also, this plant is getting very close to blooming right now. It's about two weeks ahead of the black cherry. And also, the entire size of the choke cherry is much more diminutive than a black cherry. These never get to be majorly tall trees. I, I might see them to be 15 or 20 feet tall. But the fruit will be ripe uh, in August, and it will be kind of a dark maroon color. And it's called choke cherry, not because the berries are poisonous. They're not, but they will. They're very astringent, so they'll make your cheeks cave in if you just try to eat them just raw, but if you cook them, that uh, subdues that character. And also, if you use the choke cherry juice uh, to make jelly, the flavor stands up very well to the jelly making process and makes a very nice uh, jelly. So this is the choke cherry. 
So now I'm going to talk about the common European barberry, Berberis vulgaris. It's not as well known as the Japanese barberry, Berberis thunbergii, and uh, Japanese barberry is a really hated invasive species, uh, and it pushes into the undergrowth. This is called the common barberry, but this is actually less common than the Japanese barberry. And this has the tastier fruit. I don't consider Japanese barberry to be edible, but this fruit, although it's very sour, makes what I consider to be the best jelly. So what, one of the ways to identify it is you see the flowers are hanging down in clusters of like a dozen or so per cluster. Uh, on the, you know, it's a pendulous dangle like this. So Japanese barberry le uh, flowers and fruits do not do that. They're much closer to the stalk and they come in, in singles or pairs. And so I had a woman who, on one of my wa wild edible walks, who said the way that she remembers the difference is that Japan is just one country, is in Europe is many countries. So this is the many country barberry, the European barberry with just uh, more flowers and more fruits. They look like uh, same size and shape as a bright red Tic Tac. And that's what you gather to make the tea, the uh, jelly from. And so uh, I do it uh, just about every year. And one nice thing about the barberries is they're ripe in the like mid to late fall, and then they often persist on the bushes like Thanksgiving, Christmas. And so you can be, you know, looking to, you know, get outside and do something productive with yourself over Thanksgiving holiday, Christmas holiday, and go pick some barberries and then make a batch of jelly. So let me tell you a quick story I tell in my book. So one year I made a batch of jelly and ordinarily there's enough pectin in the fruit to get it to gel or you add a little bit and it comes out fine. So I'm making this batch of jelly, didn't add enough pectin. And so once the jelly cooled, it didn't solidify. It was just all runny. And so those of you that make jelly know you can put it back in the stove, add pectin and get it to come out right. But I didn't have time at the time. So I just took all that liquid and I put it all in a quart sized yogurt container and I put it in my fridge and I forgot about it for three months. And when I eventually found it, lifted up the lid, it was really disgusting looking. It had all this scum in the top. It had all the sediment in the bottom. And I was just about to pitch it down the sink. And then I thought, well, just for the sake of scientific curiosity, I'd like to taste it and see how, what happened. And I tasted it and I started giggling because it's the best wine I've ever had. It was a complete accident, delicious. All I can tell you is that the, uh, I can't give you an exact recipe. All I can do is tell you that Barbary makes great wine. The last, edible plant I have time to talk to you about for this virtual foraging walk is actually my number one favorite out of all the edible wild plants that are out there. The more than 200 species that are out there, this is my number one favorite species. This is the shag bark hickory. And if you look at the trunk of the tree, you can see how apt the name is. And obviously it's not a seasonal phenomenon. Any time we saw you encounter these trees in the landscape, they're going to have that shaggy appearance. So. I'm always paying attention as I'm driving around where the shag bark hickory trees. And if I see some trees that I didn't know about before, I still have those old fashioned printed road atlases in my car and I'll pull over and get one of those atlases are and I'll mark a spot on that map where those shag bark hickory trees were so I remember where they are to go visit them in the fall. So this is a fall foraging opportunity. Although I've heard of some people tapping shag barks to extract sap. I've never done it. I can't give you any details about that. The part I'm eating are the shag bark hickory nuts. So if we look up into the tree now, and you look at these trees up here, above me, you'll see some catkins hanging down. And those is the blooming of the tree that's happening now. So between now and when the nuts are available, it's not going to be until uh, mid-September at the earliest. But this is a good sign. If you see a tree that's blooming, then there's a pretty good possibility that this tree will be producing nuts uh, come the fall. Starting around September 15th is when I start looking for ripe shagbark hickories. And what you're looking for is a green four-parted uh, husk that surrounds the nut. And it's shiny and green. And uh, you'll be able to see those on the trees for at least a month before they start falling off. After a while, you'll see all those green hickory nuts on the ground, or sometimes the impact of a ripe hickory nut falling off the tree and hit the ground, burst that four-parted uh, 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 husk off the nut, and you're just seeing the nut inside, which is tan in color, and that's the shell, and then you have to crack that open to get the nut meat. And the flavor, it's like a walnut that has been lightly sprayed with maple syrup. So, uh, and people I know that 
are familiar with the flavor of pecans, which is a relative of the shagbark hickory, and shagbark hickory say shagbark hickories taste even better than pecans. So why are we seeing shagbark hickories for sale all over the place? It's because the shell is kind of hard to open, and we haven't figured out a way to mechanize it to, you know, lower the cost. So you have to do it by hand, and, uh, and the technique that I've developed is where you use a hammer, and if you hit it in a certain part on the shell, tip sideways, and you hit straight down on a hammer, and you don't pulverize it, but you hit it just hard enough to send cracks through the shell, then more often than not, the two halves open right up, and that's how you get the big pieces out. Now, I'd be misleading you if I told you that I never used a nut pick. I do use a nut pick because although you do get pieces that separate out from the shell just through hammering them open that way, there's still some pieces where the nut shells are better than the nut meats are better than the shell. And the, the device I used to separate out the nut meats in the shell, I learned from a farmer in Wisconsin, he uses dental, dental tools like what they work on your teeth in a dentist office because they have those nice pointy tips to them and that works better than like the traditional uh, nut picker that you get, you know, the same one that you use for extracting meat from a lobster legs. So anyway, and, uh, and the shag bark hickories are really good. Just plain, like put in a toaster oven for a couple minutes, excellent, just right into your mouth. Or they're excellent at baking, better than walnuts or pecans in any kind of baking. So in my book, I've got a recipe for uh, maple hickory nut pie, which is the New England version of a pecan pie. And virtually everybody I've served that to say, hey, this is even better than pecan pie. And, um, and uh, were this to be a live in-person walk, I may have some treats I've made for you with hickory nuts. Like uh, uh, one of my favorites is a triple maple hickory nut sandwich cookie. Got plenty of time now. It's it's uh, June when you're watching this show, so uh, you've got several months before the hickories start falling to find out where they are in your neighborhood, in your region, and then scope them out and be ready to gather when the time comes. So I hope you've had an interesting uh, virtual taste of the wild, the nibbling that we've uh, done and learned about in this session, and I encourage you all to have uh, some happy foraging times ahead. So long.